All right, finally I'm back here with my Wimbledon wrap. I think it's kind of appropriate that the sun is setting behind us here on the Forest Park golf course behind me. I'm in Forest Park in Queens. I think the McEnroe brothers are from Queens, if I'm correct. I know they're from New York. And for this wrap, I do want to stay focused on all the emotions that were created by an epic men's final. I want to talk a little more about Federer. Uh, I have a whole bunch of notes here that I made to try to get this organized and, and get this out. It's really better for an article, but I'll do it as my wrap. And I also want to talk about this idea again of the win-loss ideal in our society and, and why we have to adhere to it so strongly now. Of course, there's, not, there's no sport without the win-loss ideal, but maybe we can move past that or at least start to do that. Uh, as far as Roger, I'll start there again. Um, at this point, I'm beginning to think Roger might be the most beloved athlete we've ever seen. I mean, the, the, the appeal and the back, backing he gets is just, I, I don't know that I've ever seen it or heard of it or read about it. You know, I didn't see what it was like for Babe Ruth back in the day. That He's a famous baseball player from America. He supposedly had a huge magnanimous following, and there's been many others. And of course, Rafa Nadal has an unbelievable following, and Novak has his many fans, but I, I don't, I can't remember somebody like Roger, even over Michael Jordan, to be honest, but anyways, and I always thought it was his superior tennis, the way people were seeing it the way I was, like all this, maybe not all the subtleties, which I try to point out, but just his incredible finesse and grace on the court. But it finally hit me in, in this uh, match, actually, in this, in, at the end of this tournament, actually just thinking about it when I was at Rockaway yesterday. Um, I think he's so famous, not just because of his superior tennis, but a lot to do because he's so human. And what I mean by that is he has such great potential, yet he's so flawed. I actually heard a golfer back here a little bit ago hit out of the sand trap, and he said something like, you stink, like he was yelling at himself. And I don't think that Nadal and Federer and Djokovic are saying that to themselves on the court. But those are the things all athletes deal with, all players, amateur, professional. And Roger seems to struggle a little more with that than, say, Novak and Nadal. Not that they don't struggle too, but they do such superior, incredible things with the mind. And, and, and it still seems like Roger's almost like a Superman, but has his kryptonite. And he still battles those demons. And I think that's what makes him so beloved when I think about it. It's not his, ten, it's not his incredible tennis. It's, his, it's the flaws in him still that he battles, the demons. And I think we all relate to that. And, and, and we all just root for him so much now because we see how great he is. I think he knows it too, you know, and, and obviously. And he has incredible belief, you know. But, but that's the next question I want to ask is, what is his kryptonite? You know, and I'm, I was wondering, is it the self-belief? And, and I know that sounds insane. Roger Federer, belief issues. But, you know, is it as strong as Novak's and, and, and Rafa's? Um, I, I'm not going to say it is or it isn't. Uh, you know, this is getting real psychological now. I don't know. But uh, I wonder sometimes, and I'm maybe applying myself a bit too much, and I'm certainly not like some great tennis player, great at anything, you know, that I can say. But I'm just wondering, as I try to relate, I wonder if he thinks a little too much, uh, maybe oversensitive, maybe over creative. Uh, maybe he's simply, you know, um, Maybe it's something you know that's very deep and undefinable, and we can't even define it. Uh, I'm not sure, but um, you know, when he had 40-15 championship points, I go back to that. He threw down what looked like a service winner, at least maybe an ace, because Djokovic, Djokovic was leaning this way, and the tee was over here, and Roger served down the tee. Novak was on the wrong side. Now he may have got a racket on because he's amazing at a, as a returner, but I wonder. It will, well, Roger clipped the net, and it didn't go over, and his wife actually put her head in her hand, hands. And, you know, the first thing I thought is, why we make such a big deal that he just did that? But because we're all so freaked out that he's blown it before, especially against Novak, but against other people. And we want to see him. You know, I could maybe make a novel, and each chapter would be the, the tournaments he messed up, and why, or the matches, and how I could probably 
throw in another 10 slams or so for him, honestly, that he, I, I, maybe I will do it someday, but again, it, it would be so cutting to Roger, and of all people, this hurts the most, it's Roger, more than the fans, I mean, Roger's got to live with it, and he's got a great life, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't bother him, or it doesn't hurt him, and it doesn't mean he deals with these demons, you know, knowing how great his tennis is, and wondering why so many times he hasn't closed the deal, even against Rafa, a lot of French Opens, a lot of break points, he didn't deal with, or a lot of, there was a lot more close matches. You go back and look at a lot of those. Not 2008, but there were a lot of close matches. Anyway, so what is it? What is it that he clips the net, that serve doesn't go over, finish the match? What is it? Um, you know, Roger's just going to say, hey, look, it could have gone either way. I mean, what can you say? Well, again, it's hard to understand. But, and it's something we can always ponder. And, and learn from and grow from it and, and also wonder what it is that Rafa and, and Djokovic do that make them get over that edge. But let me ask this, and I was wondering this as well. It, does Roger really struggle with belief or does he struggle with anything anymore? Like, you know, I'm saying that in his career he has. But recently, he's been beating his arch nemesis, his arch rival, Rafa Nadal. And he's beat him over and over. And the only time he lost at the French Open was 35 mile per hour wind gusts that totally destroyed his game. I have another video on that alone. So that I don't, I throw that out the window. Other than that, Roger wins now. So he did it again. He, he had to be so mentally strong. And he even said it, it's miserable to play Rafa. Uh, he can't play free versus Rafa. Uh, he, Rafa has too much spin. He has the most greatest heavy spin of all time that we've ever seen with these new rackets. And Ro Roger normally can just be in his sleep with his eyes closed, hit lines, do whatever. Can't do that against Rafa. He's got to be very patient, make sure just to get that ball back in the court and not really go for it until he's really set up right. And actually he did a lot of junk ball with Rafa on the dead grass, which I already talked about. But, um, you know, he can do all that, but he can't just easily go for winners against Rafa. And, you know, he is so miserable playing Rafa that I kind of got fooled because I did have a source say that, I had two actually, but one mainly saying about Roger's back. I thought I was seeing that. You see the beautiful sunset behind me. But I thought I was seeing that too. Uh, and now I look back, because the way he was against Novak, I don't think there was anything going on. I mean, the back was sore, maybe maybe there was some soreness, whatever, just normal stuff for a 38-year-old, at the or 37 at the end of a tournament. And uh, I saw some body fatigue at the end of Novak, but that's it. You know, up until then, there wasn't even body fatigue. So the reason Roger looks so miserable against Ra Rafa is because Rafa makes him miserable. Those spins are very hard for Roger's game. It's flat strokes and his genius. He can't really do it. So he had to be very strong-minded, strong-willed and calm and, and just fight through, be patient, work, 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 work. Never let it go until the very end and Roger let up, yeah, like he finally let it go. That is enormous amount of emotional and mental stress. And he had to take that in. I know he didn't play the next day, but he played two days later, and now we have another big test against another great player. And he had a concentration lapse in the first set tiebreak. He had some la he had a letdown in the third set. He really could have won in three sets, four sets. And then after, oh, and then at the end of the fifth set, in the tiebreak in the fifth set, again, I, I think then he just fatigued out. It was just like, he it wasn't even, I mean, he had some body fatigue at the end, but it was more like the mind just, I'm done. I'm done. And I feel like that yesterday. I thank God I got to go to the, I had to go to the beach and I didn't get this thing out till now because I was exhausted mentally after all this, maybe emotionally too. So anyway, Roger was just done in that fifth set tie break. Okay. And, and did the very best he could. It's not any cut on him. It, it's exhausting when none of us will know what that's like without being there. Now, um, you know, so I do wonder, has Roger made that leap to the next level? And if you're hearing this, Roger, maybe you did. And if you have, I'm wrong. I'm glad I'm wrong. You made it. You beat your arch nemesis many times now. It was just too much back to back. And those little lapses are all it took. But I still come back to those missed chances. 40-15, two championship points. It's not the first time. Again, I could write a novel about this. Maybe one day I will. Uh, but if I do it, it's going to be with the utmost greatest respect to Roger. Anyway, uh, what else do we have here in my notes? Um, those are just my finishing thoughts on, um, on, that, on that final. And then I want to jump to what I had written yesterday, what I posted. Uh, can we move past this win-loss ideal and grow? Uh, I already talked about uh, grow as a society, grow as a fan base. I already talked a lot about uh, 
that the best tennis doesn't always win. I've already talked about that. But the word best is very subjective. And I know this, you know. Now, I think Federer's movement and variety on grass is the best. He's the best grass player. That's my opinion. I think Novak slips, loses his footing, takes bigger steps. He's not as good at the grass. I think Rafa's not as good at the low ball variety. All those little low balls coming down to Rafa out of the picture, and he couldn't handle those dead balls, okay? So I think Roger's the best on grass, okay? I also think Roger, in some ways, is the best overall because he does it all. His subtle power finesse combo is better than anything we've seen from anybody else ever okay that's so i look at that variety i think he touches upon all the different facets of tennis better than anyone you know uh, novak starts from they novak and, and and nadal the other two great ones and I, murray but well, another day uh but anyway those this two we're talking about have a power athleticism especially rafa and with his big spins and novak does have some more subtlety like with his return and serve game he has a lot more subtlety i think than people know uh, he fakes people out a lot. He fakes Roger out, and Roger fakes him out. They go back and forth. But, you know, but anyways, you know, Rafa's the war machine, the war tank. Uh, Novak's more the retrieval. Everything starts from the defense to the offense. Uh, most, he's improved a lot, but a lot of it. Okay, so again, that's why I show so many videos of Roger, because I'm trying to show his subtlety. And I think people miss it a lot. Okay, even the fans of him. They love his grace and his great struggle, but they notice the shot making, all the setup, all the instinct, the positioning of his body, and that all seems to get mixed up and nerve-wracked under pressure. And like uh, my buddy Gil Gross says, it's a lot easier to retrieve, it's a lot easier to do power spins and just power it down, like set up and set down and power. Like you grab someone in a wrestling hold and you grab them. That's, that's easier than sitting there trying to make amazing shots, okay, or make three-point shots in basketball. So Roger has that to go with, and he does it amazingly, but it's a, ten, it's a tough way to go. I thought Roger against both Rafa and Novak did play a lot more of a defensive uh, thing throughout, and, and it helped, but still, it's, it's tough for him. But anyway, this is all my opinion. This is what I like about Roger. Other people may say, no, I think defense to offense is the number one thing in tennis. So these people, someone's lost his ball, but they, these people um, would think J J no, Djokovic's the best, or Rafa with his power and athleticism, he's the best. He might be the best, the greatest athlete we've ever seen play tennis. I agree with that one about Nadal, the greatest, strongest mind. And, and Novak's the greatest flexibility and the greatest defense we've ever seen. Uh, not as good on clay and grass, but on a hard court, it's ridiculous, but he's still really good. He has struggled, he struggles moving on grass, as I said, yet still plays great defense. So. Um, you know, so in saying all that, my opinion, I feel Roger's the one evolving the sport more, the most, and with his power, uh, aggressive variety. Sort of like how Agassi evolved it, by taking the ball quick and then later doing off-court regimens and training. Okay, Sampras won it all because it was a faster conditions back then. Now it's a little slower conditions. They've gotten a little quicker again, but they were slower, so Roger's had to deal with that, okay? So, you know, everybody said, but, but that's, again, my opinion. And I will go back to this again. You know, and obviously many agree with me. They love Roger and all this. But, again, a lot of that could also be the frailty I'm talk I talked about. But, again, let's just enjoy it. Let's enjoy all this. You're a Novak fan, a Rafa fan. It's cool. It's, you know, and maybe my videos will show the subtlety of Roger. And maybe I need to make some more with Rafa and Novak, but again, I, I keep thinking, it's, I, I think it's more obvious with them, but you know what, I'll do maybe some stuff on Novak's return of serve and serving, because he will look up, Roger, Roger does this all the time, he's so good with the ball toss, he takes a look and throws it up, and he, where you're leaning or whatever, he goes the other way with the serve, does it all the time. I saw it a couple years ago at Wimbledon, Novak started like leaning one way and jumping the other way, so it's some cool stuff. Maybe I should get into that a little bit, so that's the subtle part. But as far as great athleticism, uh, stretching, flexibility, uh, power, spins, everybody's looked at that. Everybody's analyzed that. I don't feel like I want to go there because it's all over the place. You can see that. And it doesn't mean it's any less great, I'm just saying. That, that's, that's why I show so much Federer. Uh, what else do we have here? But it would be nice if we could stop talking so much, media, <laughs> fans, about GOAT, greatest of all time. I, honestly, I made a joke. I was talking about the Doherty brothers in the 1800s, but they introduced the, the volleying to the game. Bill Tilden, I think, was the first guy over six foot. I'm not sure this is all exactly true. It's stuff I remember reading about it. 
but uh, Suzanne Longlin running around, grabbing a drink. Yeah, I'm exaggerating, but she was a wild lady and then she played wild on the court. But there's so much great stuff and that's going way back. What about McEnroe, Connors, all this different, there's so much stuff. Uh, I don't know. I mean, we're in the modern era. I guess we can go about it, but maybe just not so much talk about GOAT, so much talk about, talk about who has the most slams. And I'm not just saying this because maybe it looks like Novak's going to have the most later. I don't know that I even care that much, to be honest. I know the players probably don't. Uh, they say they don't. I know that Roger and Rafa don't seem to care quite as much. Maybe they do. Maybe they do. I don't know. But it's just a great time in tennis. This sport's awesome. If you love this sport, why don't we just pump that up? And one day this could be the greatest sport ever. I really believe that. And I have my reasons for it, a lot of reasons. But one of them is if we do mass move past win-loss ideal, this will be the sport because this sport has it all. It has all the variety of cultures all over the world. And our, got our Dominican Republic guy, uh, Australia. And then we have all the, the, the women, the men, we may have some other later in the future. Who can, cool, man, this is a great sport. Variety of surface, variety of balls. Cl uh, it, it has everything, and I think one day that will be a big part of it. But, you know, it doesn't, you know, we have to move a little bit past the win-loss ideal for that, in my opinion. Uh, and by the way, I would love to interview Novak. I would love to really sit down and know what he's overcome in his life. And in that match, and just I just love to hear it. He said a little bit, but that kind of stuff. He's an he's an amazing story. He used to be on the courts. His dad's yelling at him. He's throwing up. He still has the breathing issues. We've seen it again. I don't think people realize that's what that is still, but that is, and he deals with it. Makes his legs wobbly, his body, whatever. But yeah, I'd like to. I, there's so much about Novak, but it's more that mind stuff and what he's gone through. I want to know about. And then I would love to get Rafa's opinion, Rafa Nadal on what he saw. Did he watch the match in full? Maybe he couldn't, I don't know. But if he did, I would love an in-depth, real opinion from Rafa. The greatest mind ever in sport, in my opinion. Sorry, Michael Jordan, you were amazing, but I'm just saying. And I would wonder what Rafa thought about all that, the mental stuff that went down, how much his match with Federer affected that match. I, I, there was so much I would love to ask Rafa, because I think Rafa just, he would have him, Maybe he'd have nothing, I don't know, but I think he'd have a really cool answers. Finally, um, for me, uh, I'm exhausted <laughs> mentally, as I said, from all this from these last couple of weeks. I'm glad I finally finished these out. I wanted to make sure to finish all these videos, make sure I finish what I started on this. Um, I'll revisit all this another time. This is cool stuff. It's a long video. It was a lot to say. Um, I will make videos for the U.S. Open. Uh, I'd maybe do some in between. I'm not sure. I'll be at qualifying live. I'll be doing that. Uh, but for me now, you know what I get to enjoy? Like a coach who loves to teach, I love to watch. I'm a watcher, man. I love it. I play, I play sports all my life, but I'm like, I love the watching. I've learned more from that than I did from playing, to be honest, in a certain way. I mean, there's things you learn from playing, you only learn from playing. But uh, I have more Wimbledon matches I haven't seen it. I want to see because I'm keeping up on some of the different players and, and their player pages. For me, I make player pages for over 300 players. Uh, and I have to get to American football. The season's getting ready to go, and I have to find out what's happening, where everybody, the trades, the new coaches, whatever. And I love this. I love this behind the scenes. That's why it took me so long to come out and do any kind of videos and stuff, though I was doing them a long time ago. Uh, but this is what I like to do. Watch, learn, and love.